So as it currently stands, Formula 1 is in the middle of redoing the tenders to see who is going to supply the FIA ladder from 2025 onwards, and it's standard practice for Formula 1 or well, pretty much any other business, really. So put simply, what a tender is, is a pitch, and I've had to write a couple of these things out before in my old job. Let's say a local big company wants to replace its aging fleet of vans, and needs someone to supply them with new ones. You basically do a, we can get you this, this, this and this, which will do that, that and that, which on the brief is what you want, and it's going to cost you this much over this many years. This one, in particular, is going to cost you 100 grand below your maximum spend. What then happens is that the boss at local big company decides that 100 grand under the max spend is too expensive, and that he wants the newest and best Mercedes vans because they're nicer and they've got a massive star on the front, but he's been told repeatedly that this will run him over budget. So local big company boss decides to go and get them from elsewhere because he can get them at X price from this other place, and ends up spending over anyway. Now you might be thinking, this is an oddly specific example. I know, because this has happened. More than once. It's quite annoying. So that's basically what F1 is doing with the tyre stuff, but it's actually struggling a bit at the minute because as it stands, Pirelli and Bridgestone are the only two companies showing interest, because other companies that have been invited to tender have got some terms and conditions attached to things that are key to their involvement. At the same time, there's now two companies, and people are saying, just have them both! Tire war! Tire war, you say? So that's what today's video is about, really. And if you type in F1 tire wars into Google, it's all the newer stuff with, will there be another tire war? And people getting unnecessarily excited and writing it like a bombshell headline for the clicky clicky. But across F1's history, there have been multiple times where there have been multiple tire suppliers in the sport, stretching back all the way to the beginning. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, F1 teams used tyres from Dunlop, Engelbert, Firestone, Continental, Goodyear and more. I can't find much information on any of them, but I'm assuming that the teams used what best fit their cars, or were within the budget of what they were operating under. Or in the case of someone like Lotus, may be connected with a particular brand through what the road car part of the company was doing or using. Either way, you had as many as six companies all supplying rubber at the same time, and looking at the results from the times you'll see a letter next to the team name denoting what tyres they were on. F for Firestone, D for Dunlop, G for Goodyear, etc. These tyres were built similar to road tyres with cotton plies wound around the carcasses for reinforcement, but all that changed in 1958 when Dunlop introduced the R5, which replaced that cotton with nylon and in turn reduced the weight of each tyre by about 12 pounds or 5 kilos, which translated to better on-track performance, and then this technology trickled down into road tyres. Different brands worked better in different conditions, as during the 1968 German Grand Prix, Jackie Stewart's Matra, which was on Dunlops, which were designed for wet conditions, decimated the rest of the field that was predominantly on Firestones. Also in the 50s and 60s, the cars used tyres with tread that wouldn't be out of place on road cars, much like how the tyres are in Formula E because those tyres in that series are designed to be all-weather tyres that save on costs. They also lasted longer than an Undertaker entrance at WrestleMania and were rock solid, so they were perfect for those long slugfests of Grand Prix versus the 90-ish minute Grand Prix that they run today. But the second revolution in the early tyre wars changed at the Spanish Grand Prix in 1971. Legend has it that Firestone sent Ferrari a set of tyres that didn't have treads already on the rubber. Ferrari was going to use the tyres for testing before the Spanish Grand Prix, and Firestone was supposed to send a technician out to Maranello to cut a tread specific for that car while he was there, so Ferrari could get the most out of those particular tyres. Long story short, the technician ran late, and Enzo got impatient, so he sent Jackie Ix out on these uncut tyres. And it was revelatory. The times improved, the traction was better, cornering speeds were higher, there was no tread distortion. Slicks were now the way to go. Then, in 1977, Michelin began constructing radial ply tyres, which involved the carcasses being wrapped at 45 degrees as opposed to 90 degrees, and that allowed better stiffness, which forced Goodyear, Pirelli and others to develop their own versions in rapid time, just to keep up. And while Goodyear is the company most associated with this classic era of Formula 1 from the early to mid 1970s and then into the 90s, there was definitely a war going on, as Michelin and Bridgestone were also in the mix, albeit with varying levels of success. Goodyear tyres were still the tyres to have, but in 1972, Firestone won the most races. In 1981, it was Michelin, and 1983 and 1984 also being Michelin winners, in terms of winning the most races over the course of that season, that is. But it's interesting to see teams swap manufacturers mid-season as things changed, as in 1981 Williams used both Michelin and Goodyear, Tyrrell used Goodyear and Avon, 
Fittipaldi used Michelin, Avon and Pirelli. It is interesting to see Ferrari on Michelins though. But by 1995 and the height of the insane turbo era, it was the good years that were the way forward, with Pirelli a secondary contributor to the series. But the Italian tyres were typically found on back of grid teams or teams with lower budgets. In 1992, Goodyear would be the sole supplier. Until 1997 that is. In 1997 Bridgestone entered the sport, initially supplying the newcomer and back of grid teams in Prost, Arrow, Stewart, Minardi and Lola. I mean, I say they supplied Lola. But once again Goodyear had the competitive edge, as their hard compound tyre was equal to Bridgestone soft, which meant that in normal racing conditions the Goodyear turned on faster and was more competitive. But in the hotter conditions, the Bridgestone was able to turn on at the rate the Goodyears could normally, and in turn would last longer, whereas the Goodyears would just burn themselves out, blister and, and all that stuff. And this is how Damon Hill was almost able to win that 1997 Hungarian Grand Prix. But because of this tyre war, the FIA became concerned that the late brake drivers such as Jacques Villeneuve were slamming on their brakes and pulling up for corners at a rate not ever seen before. The tyre performance had increased so much that Villeneuve's pole time in Australia was a full 3 seconds faster than what he'd done at the same race 12 months previous. So for 1998, the FIA said to Bridgestone and Goodyear that they had to cut 3 grooves in the front and 4 grooves in the rear. And this upset Goodyear as they felt that this went against the ethos of being competitive. So they said they were going to withdraw at the end of 1998. By which point Bridgestone was supplying most of the grid anyway and their tyres were now better than Goodyear's. So for the 1999 and 2000 season only Bridgestone was left standing, but in 2001 a new competitor would re-enter the sport. Michelin The Bridgestone vs Michelin war is probably a lot more intense than the other wars we've already looked at, purely because this was Formula 1 at its most excessive, to the point where Bridgestone decided only one team was worth its time. And I've always been quite careful with the whole Ferrari and bespoke Bridgestone thing because it seemed like it was one of those urban myths or something cooked up by Eddie Jordan or just to avoid salty anti-Ferrari comments in the well, comments section. But on a previous video I did get this helpful comment that confirmed things. I worked for Bridgestone in 2004, the tyres were indeed tailored to the Ferrari. We test with Jordan, Sauber and Minardi too, but regardless of how well they went on different tyres, we always took Ferrari's preference. At the end of year party in Japan, all four teams were invited to attend and the car on the cake was red. They could have had a red one, a yellow one, a purple one and a black one, but no. I was ashamed and team personnel began leaving. Not only was it competition, it was business. That's what it became. Bridgestone did everything for Ferrari because they were the best chance of winning, while Michelin had Williams, McLaren, Renault and BAR running at all close to the front. Four teams versus one. Makes you wonder that had Michelin done the same with McLaren and Williams that Bridgestone had done with Ferrari, it might have been closer. But Japan and France were both able to build a competitive tyre. Both sides would win races over the course of a season, and in 2003 it was pretty close. 9-7 in Japan's favour. But in its debut season in 2001, Michelin still won four races. But like the Goodyears and Bridgestones in 1997 and 1998, they still had their own particular quirks, which I've mentioned in other videos. The Michelins were better in the wet and the hotter conditions. They also turned on faster but had a bigger drop off versus the Bridgestones which had way more consistency, even if the Bridgestones took longer to heat up due to being slightly harder. The Michelins being good in the hotter weather is probably why the 2003 season was a lot closer than the 2002 and 2004 seasons, since there was a pretty hefty heatwave in Europe that year, and Michelin had done something to the sidewalls of their tyres. An example of this was referenced in a recent video, the 2004 French Grand Prix video I did a couple of weeks ago. Alonso was able to go off into an early lead and stay there while Schumacher's tyres took time to get to temperature, but it all cancelled out once the Michelins dropped off so that early advantage was gone but the war was effectively ended by what happened during the 2005 US Grand Prix, which knackered Michelin's reputation. Michelin did dominate the 2005 season and would have likely whitewashed it if not for that calamitous race at Indianapolis, which is a video I need to revisit for quality control purposes, but the 2006 season was the most equal of the tyre war. Both sides won 9 races each. After the 2006 season, Bridgestone continued alone, keeping the F1 car supplied with rubber until the end of 2010, which is when things were handed over to Pirelli in time for 2011, where it's still under their supply today. Bridgestone couldn't justify their spending in the economic downturn that had started in 2008, and left. And that's basically it, really. But when it came round to the whole tyre tender again, everything perked up at the prospect of another tyre war, but as I explained in one of my opinion pieces on this very topic, the chances are very slim. 
for a few reasons. Number one being that Formula One is telling the tyre companies what tyres to build for the show. This is why Michelin gave a solid no out of 10 for potentially rejoining. Michelin said they wanted to build the tyres they wanted to build and not be stuck making gimmicky tyres. They wanted to build tyres for performance. They wanted to build tyres for racing, not tyres to look good on TV. So it would rather spend its money elsewhere, particularly in endurance racing. Goodyear had left for basically the same reason at the end of 1998, so no chance of them ever coming back under these current conditions. The second being, wars cost money. There's a reason that during World War II the British used the Sten gun and asked people to hand over any old pots and pans to build aircraft, because it was a cheap option at that particular time. With inflation going the way it is and the economy being absolutely rinsed through various world events, are the tyre companies going to go after two, maybe three seasons? Yeah, um, uh, the bean counters aren't liking this and the shareholders aren't liking it, so yeah, thanks lads, but see ya. I mean, especially if they're not winning. And I guess third is making sure that there is a rule that guarantees that everybody gets the same tyres, that tyres aren't built for one particular car. I mean, okay, Bridgestone and Ferrari was business and maximising the best chances of winning. And if Bridgestone was to come back with, say, Mercedes and give Lewis and George different tyres that suit that specific car and then give McLaren those same tyres that don't even work with McLaren's car, it just looks a bit silly, really. But I guess that probably won't happen due to the vast restrictions on testing these days. But it has been interesting to look at the tyre wars and how they've been going on pretty much since the beginning. In the 1955 and 1958 seasons, six tyre manufacturers were on the grid, and in those early 20 years or so of F1 between 1950 and 1970, only three seasons had one supplier, those being 61, 62 and 63. Most of the other seasons had at least two, sometimes three. It wouldn't be until 1987 that there would be just one supplier. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that want it back, but I guess it's just that nostalgia talking again. Realistically, it's not going to happen but I guess one manufacturer means that the tyres aren't doing most of the work. So then, a look at the history of tyre competition in Formula 1. If this has been of interest to you, then do like the video so I know I've done some educating, and there's also a subscribe button to click if you haven't already, if you want to see more from this channel. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help out at a more personal level, there's a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and pieces. And I've also turned on channel memberships as well if you want to support at a more obvious level because Patreon's doing some funny stuff at the minute apparently. And there's super thanks there too if you just want to buy me a coffee. So until next time I've been Aidan Mord, have a great day wherever you are and goodbye.